The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals used to be very liberal. Then we got a little bit of a change over the last four years with the Trump administration, and now they have been trending a little bit more conservative. Previously, we had a ruling out of the Ninth Circuit that was removing a ban that California had put in place to prohibit people from having high capacity magazines. So we're talking about firearms. YouTube doesn't like when we talk about that. So we're gonna just talk about these things as second amendment issues. And so there, there were new laws out of California that were infringing upon people's ability to have high capacity magazines for their second amendment devices. And th there very recently, there was a change in that. We thought that largely that this ruling would stand, that the Ninth Circuit would stand by their ruling, but they are now allowing the government who wants to impose the ban, who wants to bring it back out, they're allowing them to be reheard on the case. And you're thinking, well, wait a minute, I thought it was a final ruling, kind of, but not quite. So let's dig into this story because it's going to, we're going to be revisiting this very soon. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals eyes the California ban on the high capacity ammo magazine. So on Thursday, it will reconsider a three judges court split ruling last year that threw out California's ban on high capacity ammunition, a decision with potential impacts in other states. There's an 11 member panel on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. They are going to rehear the case after two members of the three judge appellate panel ruled in August that California's ban on these magazines that hold more than 10 bullets violates the U.S. Constitution protections of the right to bear arms. So what this is saying is... Back in August, there was some litigation going on. We're going to go through some of the case history here briefly. But what they're saying is there was a, a ban that was passed into the law. The lower court said, no, you cannot do that. That's infringement on the Second Amendment. It went up to the Court of Appeals. The government appealed and appealed and went up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. The Ninth Circuit then, they did the whole court didn't hear everything. So they have these hearings where basically three members, there's a panel of judges on the appellate panel who will hear a case and grant a decision. Then if they sort of request that the entire court hear the case, then the court can re-vote on it and they can bring back in all 11 judges. So the way the reason they split it up into sort of smaller contingents is so they can process more cases. Okay, we got a lot of cases coming through here. Three of you go handle that, three of you go handle that, three of you go handle that, and so on. But if that ruling is not... Uh, favorable or if there's disagreement amongst that. So if the three judges go and they issue a ruling, they say, we heard the case, we heard the arguments, here's our opinion, this is what the order of the court is, then they can go back to the full panel. And if the full panel votes, uh, there, there's if, if enough of the panel votes to hear the case, then the case comes back up and all 11 people hear it. So even though the three people ruled that this ban was unconstitutional, now that it's coming back up, the full panel could reverse that. So this, this, this sort of position that many people in the Ninth Circuit, which covers a lot of states, Arizona, California, uh, I think most of the West Coast is in there. If it, if it changes, then now we're going to have a circuit that says you can ban high capacity magazines. And so the original underlying law was about 10 bullets, which was the limitation that we saw out of California. This article goes on. The third member had said that ruling conflicts with decisions in six other appellate courts across the nation and with the 2015 ruling, I'm sorry, the third member had said that the ruling conflicts with decisions in six other appellate courts across the nation. So we're going to, we, we may have a split, a split uh, series of circuits. Advocates on both sides said they are eager for a rematch, a reflection of the changing nature of the federal courts. The once notoriously liberal Ninth Circuit has shifted to the right with recent appointments by President Donald Trump and Second Amendment advocates are anxious to get such laws before the more conservative U.S. Supreme Court. However, a majority of the nation's high court in June declined to consider several challenges to federal, state, and gun control laws, including Massachusetts' ban, on large capacity ammunition magazines. We're excited to have another opportunity to defend what Californians already know, law-abiding citizens' ability to purchase, possess, and use standard capacity magazines to purchase, possess, and use, I'm sorry, it, they're saying it, it's a fundamental right and shall not be infringed. Now we have the state attorney general, uh, Xavier Becerra, who is awaiting confirmation of Biden's new cabinet. He called the rehearing decision critical and said the next step in the defense of our state's common sense gun laws. Common sense gun laws. Don't you like that? Everything's common sense when it comes to the guns. All right. So here is the order 
And I want to show you just sort of practically how this works. We can see it's Virginia Duncan versus Xavier Becerra in his official capacity as the AG, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. This one was filed yesterday, February 25th, signed off on by the judge, Thomas, uh, Chief Judge Thomas. Upon the majority of non-recused active judges, it is ordered the case be reheard on banc pursuant to the Federal Rule of Appellate Procedure 35. The three-judge panel opinion is vacated. Judge Owens and Brest did not participate or vote in this case. So there was a ruling, which was a good ruling if you're a Second Amendment advocate, and now they're saying, eh, that's vacated. It's gone now. We're going to rehear it, and they're going to rehear it soon. So let's go through what the original opinion was, because we know at least two out of the three judges were in favor of this position. There is one judge who dissented, and there's two other judges who said this is the right way to address this issue. So what are we talking about? Here is the underlying case. As you can see, this one was filed August 14th, 2020, up here, same circuit, ninth court. This is the opinion, same individual, same parties. We got Virginia Duncan versus Xavier Becerra. An appeal from the United States District Court. We got Roger T. Benitez presiding, and he is the guy who's, uh, who's in the thumbnail. Argued and submitted, submitted April 2nd, filed October, uh, August 14th. All right, here it is. So let's go in, in, into some background a little bit, and then I'm going to show you the structure of this. So it's a pretty long opinion. I think it was uh, 81 pages. I, I just synop I did a synopsis of it. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to show you what they're arguing. So the way that this opinion is read, we've got a background, and then we're going to go through the framework of the analysis. So what are they talking about? Right now they're talking about these LCMs. California Penal Code, Section 32310, prohibits people from owning LCMs. Those are large capacity magazines. See this? In 2016, California passed a law to enact a wholesale ban on the possession of LCMs by almost everyone everywhere in the state of California. Any person in, in this state who possesses any large capacity magazine, regardless of the date the magazine was acquired. And so what they did is, I mean, if you, if you had a magazine, and we have seen this bill or seen this language in a federal bill. We, we talked about HR something or other that's in the house. And this was part of that language where they're saying, look, if you have, a, if you have one of these, it is now illegal. So you're going, well, wait a minute, this used to be illegal. I just bought this thing. Uh, it, it, it was illegal five minutes ago. You're now telling me I'm a felon for being in possession of this thing? How does that work? Here it goes on. 32, uh, 32310 has not always been so broad. It was originally enacted in 2000. It prohibited the manufacture, incorporation, or sale of LCMs. So what they wanted to do is limit the creation of new LCMs, but it got modified. So now if you even have one, that is also illegal. It's, it's, it's illegal to go buy one. It's illegal to sell one. It's illegal to import them. That was the first version, but then it got modified. Now it says, well, if you, if you already did that, it's, it's illegal now. 10 years later, California declared unlawfully possessed LCMs to be a nuisance subset, subject to confiscation and destruction. They further extended that law to prohibit the purchase and receipt of these LCMs. It may seem that after the 2013 amendments, California had completed the circle in regulating the LCMs. By then, the state had long since foreclosed the transfer, the sale. 2013, it prohibited the purchase and receipt, but the law still allowed Californians who already bought them before the enactment to keep them. But then, in 2016, they passed Senate Bill 1446 that prohibited the possession outright. A few months later, Prop 63 was passed, which strengthened its prohibitions by providing that possession may constitute a misdemeanor offense punishable by up to a year's worth of jail time. So with the stroke of a pen, Prop 63, you're in possession. Now it's a misdemeanor. Now you could go to jail for a year. The law as amended also requires citizens who own LCMs to remove the magazines from the state, sell them to a firearms dealer, or surrender them to law enforcement for its destruction. So you've got your own private property. Prop 63 passes, and they say, you uh, you know that stuff you have? You, you got to go take it and get rid of it. Sell it to, uh, you know, go go give it to a state, take it out of the state, give it to a firearms dealer, surrender it to law enforcement for destruction. Just confiscating. So people say that people are, are sort of hyperventilating and freaking out about gun confiscation. They did it. 
they passed a Proposition 63. Now, it wasn't the firearm itself, but what good is a firearm without a magazine? What good is the gun without the ammunition? I shouldn't have said that word. What good is your Second Amendment boom boom stick without the ammunition? It's not that good anymore. We have under the penal code, LCM owners may permanently modify non-conforming magazines to accept 10 rounds or fewer, thus removing those magazines from the definition of what constitutes an LCM. So you can, or you can just wreck it. Okay. If it's a 30 round magazine, you just got to wreck it. So it can only hold 10. All right. That's another option for you. This is the summary of the case. The panel affirmed the district court's summary judgment in favor of the plaintiffs. So what this means is as this lawsuit was bubbling up, the district court, which is the lower level federal court, before you get up to the court of appeals, which would be the Ninth Circuit, they filed a motion for what's called summary judgment. Basically, hey, we presented our case, find in favor of us, just we don't need to go forward with a full trial. We're moving for summary judgment. What do you think? Plaintiffs were challenging the government code. They won. Then it went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme, I'm sorry, the, the Ninth Circuit Court said, basically, we affirm that lower ruling. The ban is unconstitutional. The district court said, not allowed to have that ban. Ninth Circuit affirmed that. And this is their reasoning. This is how they came to that conclusion. The Ninth Circuit employs a two-prong inquiry to determine whether the firearms and the regulations, whether they violate the Second Amendment. They're asking two questions. Number one, whether the law, so whether this prohibition burdens conduct that is protected by the second amendment. So in this question, in this case, would possessing a, a, a magazine that is considered and defined as an LCM, would that ban burden activity that is protected by the second amendment? I think the answer is unequivocally yes. If so, what level of scrutiny to apply to the regulation? So we've talked about this before on this show. We talked about the different levels of constitutional scrutiny. We have the rational basis, which is the lowest sort of if the government can find any rational basis, any conceivable reason for doing something, it's not infringing on a protected fundamental right. So they're given a lot of leeway to do what they want to do. If the government's going to impose something for you to do or impose a regulation, if it's a low, if, if that action, if that law is infringing on something that is not a protected right, then they can kind of do whatever they want. Rational basis scrutiny. We have intermediate scrutiny, which we kind of see pop up in case law from time to time. Then we have strict scrutiny. And that means that it's, it's a lot higher because the government is impinging upon a fundamental protected right. And so in order for them to be successful, in order for that new regulation, or in this case, a new governmental ban to be upheld, it's got to pass strict scrutiny, which means it's infringing on your Second Amendment rights. So therefore, it has to be absolutely necessary. And it, it, the government, in other words, has no other way to enforce or to achieve their goals. It's necessary in order for them to pass this regulation. And this regulation is the least restrictive way for them to achieve that. It's necessary and it's just, it's, the government has tried everything else. This is the only thing we can do. So that's kind of the second question. Does it pass... First of all, what level is it rational basis, intermediate scrutiny or strict scrutiny? And if it is strict scrutiny because it's burdening a Second Amendment right, how do we analyze it under that standard? A lot of const that was like a lot of constitutional stuff right there. If that went over your head, don't even think twice about it because uh, it almost did mine. Also, the panel held that under the first prong of the test, California Penal Code did burden protected conduct. First, the panel held that firearm magazines are protected under the Second Amendment. So the Second Amendment includes the magazines. The panel held that LCMs are commonly owned. They're typically used for law enforcement purposes and for lawful purposes. They are not unusual arms, quote, unusual arms, that would fall outside of the scope of the Second Amendment. Third, the panel held that LCM prohibitions are not longstanding regulations and do not enjoy a presumption of lawfulness. Fourth, the panel held that there was no persuasive historical evidence in the record showing that the LCM possession fell outside the ambit of the Second Amendment protection. Proceeding uh, to, two pr to prong two, the panel held that first strict scrutiny was the appropriate standard to apply, the higher level there. So if it's strict scrutiny, it means they're going to be looking at this ban intensely. They got to make sure if this ban is, is to be upheld, 
that it is absolutely the least restrictive thing that they can be doing in order to achieve their goals, and it's necessary to achieve those goals. The panel held that the penal code law struck at the core right of law-abiding citizens to self-defend by banning LCM possession within the home. Core right. It goes directly to the core right. Second, the panel held that a near categorical ban, so all LCMs, that it substantially burdened the core Second Amendment right. Pretty obvious, right? There's, there's sort of no exception for that. Third, the panel held that the decisions in other circuits were distinguishable. So we have, we have other circuits who are upholding similar bans, and they're saying, well, yeah, but those cases were different. This is a little bit of a different situation. It's a different law. It's a different rule. It's a different jurisdiction. They have different regulations. They can distinguish them from this instant. Fourth, the panel held that this circuit this decisions in FIAC did not obligate the panel to apply intermediate scrutiny. So they're not even going to talk about that. They just went with strict scrutiny. The panel held then, so now that we know uh, this analysis here is, is this a fundamental right? And the answer is yes, it's the Second Amendment. And there's no exceptions that would move it outside of the purview of the Second Amendment protections. So we now, now that we know it's a fundamental right, it, it's, it's something that is very important. We're going to apply strict scrutiny. So they go through the strict scrutiny analysis here. And then this, or this is where they're discussing what standard to use. They decide on strict scrutiny. Then we have down here some strict scrutiny analysis. The panel held the California Penal Code did not survive the strict scrutiny review. Why? First, the panel held that the state interests advanced here were compelling. So this, the government is saying, we want to prevent and mitigate gun violence, right? We all want that. We, we understand that. The government does have a compelling reason. Nobody wants unnecessary gun violence to happen, including the government. It is compelling. But the second, the panel held that this law was not narrowly tailored to achieve that interest, that compelling state interest that it purported to serve because the state's chosen method, which was a statewide blanket ban on the possession everywhere and for nearly everyone, was not the least restrictive means of achieving the compelling interest. So we know it's a protected right. We know that strict scrutiny applies. We know that even the government has a compelling interest to want to enforce that ban. That we don't have to agree with that interest. We don't have to say, yeah, it's true. If you reduce it from 30 to 10, who knows if that makes any difference at all? Doesn't matter. The government says it does. We say, okay, it's a compelling interest. What's your, what's your end goal? Reduce guns, reduce deaths by guns. Okay, that's compelling. We, yeah, that's a compelling interest. Now, are you doing it in a way that is the least restrictive way possible? Here, court says no. You're banning everything everywhere. It's a statewide ban. There's no exceptions. There's no little pressure relief valve. What if somebody has a very good reason why they need a higher capacity magazine? You're not providing an escape hatch for them to go and achieve that. And since we know that the Second Amendment is a fundamental right, and they're applying strict scrutiny, we need that escape hatch. Otherwise, this cannot be deemed to be the least restrictive means. The panel held that even if intermediate scrutiny were to apply, the penal code would still fail. It held that interest expressed by the state qualified as important. The means chosen to advance those interests were not substantially related to their service. So even if they drop that standard from strict scrutiny down to intermediate scrutiny, where the government has more leniency. Sort of the higher the, the standard, the more the government has to prove it's necessary and there's nothing else they can do except this. Intermediate would have dropped that down a little bit. So it wouldn't have to be compelling. It would have to just be important. It wouldn't have to be necessary to achieve the government's goals. It just needs to be, well, substantially related to achieving those goals. Whereas at the very low standard for rational basis, it is, well, it's, it's rationally connected to an outcome so the government can do whatever the hell they want. And here they're holding it to that high standard. So the question then becomes, well, what is the court going to, what, what standard is the court going to use? Why are they hearing the whole case? What part of the analysis are they going to disagree with? Are they going to say that, no, it shouldn't be a strict scrutiny analysis. They're going to drop it down to intermediate or rational basis. I'm not sure that that's going to be that compelling. Are they going to argue that it's not a fundamental right and therefore it should just be rational basis scrutiny? 
because it's a magazine and not a firearm. In other words, you're allowed to have the firearm. They're not infringing on your right to possess a firearm. They're just saying you can't have a magazine. Do you think that's compelling? Well, here's what the judge that dissented said. She would reverse the district court's grant of summary judgment. So she would have not, uh, Judge Lynn, I think it's a she, Judge Lynn wrote the majority opinion conflicted with this circuit's precedent, FIAC, and with decisions in all six sister circuits that address the Second Amendment issue presented here. Judge Lynn would hold that intermediate scrutiny applies and that it satisfies that standard. So we know that one judge is saying, no, it's not strict scrutiny. Down here, intermediate scrutiny, which means the government has to show a lot less doesn't have to be necessary. doesn't have to be the least restrictive means. Eh, it's just important. And it's, it's close enough related to that important interest. So what do you think about that? Let me show you just briefly. We'll run through some, some of the innards of this opinion. Second Amendment is a fundamental right rooted in both text and tradition. So this is the, the majority opinion that's in writing here. In McDonald versus City of Chicago, a citizen's right to self-defense held is deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition, fundamental to our scheme of ordered liberty. Many legal systems from the ancient times to the present day have recognized the right to defend oneself from the aggressors. They also reference the, uh, the Constitution, Second Amendment. 2008, the Supreme Court in Heller said the Second Amendment protects an individual right to keep and bear arms. Court, the court then in incorporated that into the state's through the 14th Amendment a couple of years later in 2010 in McDonald versus the city of Chicago. So on a federal level, you have a Second Amendment right for an individual to keep and bear arms under Heller federally incorporated to the states in 2010 under McDonald. Under this court's precedent, the penal code in the majority opinion, they say it runs afoul of the Second Amendment. Proper standard of constitutional review cannot withstand this level of scrutiny. The Ninth Circuit employs a two-pronged test. We already talked about that. Whether the law burdens the conduct that is protected by the Second Amendment, and it certainly does. And if so, what is the appropriate level of scrutiny? We already talked about that. It is strict scrutiny, prong one, California Penal Code. It burdens protected conduct. How do we know that? Well, number one, firearm magazines are protected arms under the Second Amendment. They do a lot of analysis on that under paragraph one. LCMs are not unusual arms. They're not. They're just magazines. They've been around for a long time. 30 round magazines and things more than 10 magazines, more than 10 rounds have been around forever. LCM prohibitions are not longstanding regulations. It's a new phenomenon. Therefore, they do not enjoy a presumption of lawfulness. They're new. They're just now trying to regulate these things. There is no persuasive historical evidence, persuasive historical evidence in the record showing that LCM possession falls outside the ambit of Second Amendment protection. So this is prong one, prong two, strict scrutiny. How do we know that that applies? It strikes at the core right of law-abiding citizens to defend themselves by banning LCM possession. It's a fundamental right because the Supreme Court said so. We, we saw that in Heller and McDonald. California Penal Code also substantially burdens the Second Amendment right. They're saying self-defense is a fundamental right rooted in national history. California Code substantially burdens that. Decisions in other circuits are distinguishable. FIOC does not obligate us to apply intermediate scrutiny in opposition to the dissent. It does not survive strict scrutiny review because the state interests here, they are compelling, but it's not narrowly tailored to achieve that compelling interest. Even if intermediate scrutiny were to apply, and the reason why I wanted to just point this out is let's go forward and let's say that, all right, we get back to a full panel of 11 judges. What are they going to apply? What different level of scrutiny? If they say intermediate scrutiny, well, how do you deal with that? If you're a second amendment person, well, the majority in this opinion has already responded to that. They say intermediate scrutiny as traditionally understood has a bite which means it's a little bit higher, right? It's not, it's not closer to rational basis. It's closer to strict scrutiny. Appellate courts have not settled on a particular intermediate scrutiny formulation for Second Amendment challenges, which is why intermediate scrutiny is sort of just kind of this, it's intermediate. It's, you know, stuff will typically fall into one of the other two categories and they try to squeeze this one in here when they try to make stuff work is my read on it. Three, 
Some courts have applied a diluted form of intermediate scrutiny that approximate ra approximates rational basis. So they're trying to, when they don't, when they don't like rational basis or strict scrutiny, they try to cram it in intermediate scrutiny. And then the California code would still fail to pass constitutional muster, even if it was intermediate scrutiny. In conclusion, let us be clear. We are keenly aware, and this is a little bit troubling if you're a Second Amendment person, because they're sort of passing this and then they're walking it back a little bit. We are keenly aware of the perils of gun violence. The heartbreak, devastation caused by criminals wielding guns cannot be overstated. We also understand the importance of allowing state governments the ability to fashion solutions to curb gun violence. We have thus held that California can, for example, impose waiting periods, require micro stamping of guns, and forbids felons, the mentally ill, or misdemeanor, misdemeanor ants convicted of domestic violence from owning firearms. We also want to make clear that our decision today does not address issues not before us. Very limited decision. We do not opine on bans on so-called assault weapons, nor do we speculate about the legitimacy of bans on magazines holding far lar larger quantities of ammunition. Instead, we only address California's ban on LCMs as it appears before us. So they're saying here, do not read into this. On this case, under this law, in this situation, we're going to invalidate that ban. But if something else comes down the line that we don't like, we're going to reserve the right to distinguish this case from anything that's forthcoming. And we may change gears later down the road. We may support an assault weapons ban. We may support another ban ban on increased magazines. We don't know yet because there, it hasn't come up, but now this is going back to the full court, so we may learn more. We understand the purpose in passing this law, but even the laudable goal of reducing gun violence must comply with the Constitution. California's near categorical ban of LCM infringes on the fundamental right to self-defense. It criminalizes the possession of half of all magazines in America today. It makes unlawful magazines that are commonly used in handguns by law-abiding citizens for self-defense, and it substantially burdens the core right of self-defense guaranteed to the people under the Second Amendment. It cannot stand. We affirm the district court's grant of summary judgment in favor of the plaintiffs. And so that is what, uh, what removed the ban or basically put a hold on the ban said the ban is not constitutional, but now this has all been vacated. It's all going to be reheard at the Ninth Circuit, and we'll see what they do with it. Chris Wiseman in the house with a question over from Locals.com says, I, as I understand the Ninth Circuit is the exception to en banc hearings. The Ninth holds a lottery for the panel judges plus the Chief Justice of the Ninth. All other circuits have the full included in the en banc hearings. Uh, yeah, you might be right, Chris. I don't know. That's a good, that's a good question. I really don't, I really don't know the answer to that question. It's technical, but I think that, uh, sounds like you got a good grasp on it. So take that, uh, for, uh, for Chris Wiseman's word, ninth circuit holds a lottery for judges. So it's not going to go to the full 11. It'll be the nine plus the chief justice. Thank you for that, Chris. We have another one from CA Java Bean says, shouldn't there be an exceptionally high standard of review? when the potential tyrants are trying to impair the civil right aimed at taking out tyrants. Yeah. Well, strict scrutiny is pretty high. And, you know, I think the Supreme Court has been pretty clear on this in 2008 and 2010. So, you know, I think, I think it's, they're going to make a lot of nibbles around the margins here. So in this case, well, what, let's just sort of uh, hypothesize here. What if they go and pass a new prop 63 and they have, they carve out some exclusions and they come back and they say, well, yeah, we know that it was a categorical ban on LCMs, but now we're going to modify that. So we're going to say, well, it's not as categorical. It's categorical unless you apply for a, an exception to that and you show good cause for why you should have higher capacity magazines. Well, now it's not categorical anymore. Maybe it survives strict scrutiny under this court's uh, interpretation of the rules. Hey, Rob from Osak says, I keep noticing laws that the people pass keep being changed by a small group. Example, Arizona weed law, Arizona court judges, minor tweaks to the laws. I'm shocked that's even possible with the only option is to vote them out. Irony seems like this just opens the door for corruption. Yeah, well, that's just politics. I think there, Osak. I mean, this is, this is what happens everywhere in this country. You know, something starts out. Isn't there, isn't there a, uh, isn't there like a funny cartoon on YouTube somewhere where, where, you know, a bill starts, starts as a bill and then a bunch of people stuff it with pork and it, it, by the end of the day, after it goes through all the committees and it lands on the floor and it gets voted into law, it's not even remotely anything resembling the bill. We've seen this actually happen in real time. You know, this happens all the time 
We're, we're passing a COVID-19 relief bill. Why the hell is there money in there to save the owls in Minnesota? What are you talking about? Um, that's just an example. I don't know if it's really in there. Probably because everything's in there. But yes, there's a, there's a lot of pork. There's a lot of corruption, a lot of malfeasance that happens in the drafting and running of this country. We have Ma Fox says, as for your example of magazines not being part of firearms, therefore not subject to rights granted via the Constitution, you have a right to health care, but you have to pay for it. It's not much of a right then, is it? Yeah, that's a good distinction there. I like that analogy, the health care analogy. Yeah, I mean, if it's, I think it's kind of the same argument with some of the free speech stuff, right? People say a lot of that, well, you have a right to free speech, but you don't have a right to say certain things, or you don't have a right to a particular forum. You know, it's sort of like, well, you have a right to equal rights if you are talking about race. You have a right to, f back in the 1960s, right? You have a right to ride a bus, but you can't sit in the front. You have a right to a restaurant. You have a right to eat food, but not here. You have a right to come sit down in this park, but not on that bench. You have a right to drink water, but not that fountain, right? And we have all recognized that that's just ridiculous across the board. That's, that's stupid. There are certain fundamental rights that we think exist. And those, those should, in my opinion, should be, we, we should be able to express those as fully as possible, as long as it's not impeding on or interfering with another person's rights. Good question. Good comment there, Ma. The second amendment seems pretty clear. I feel that any prohibition on gun ownership on individuals that have served their sentences is an infringement that comes from liberty or death. Yeah, you know, you know, Liberty, I think that even um, Amy Coney Barrett agrees with that. So you're in good company. You got a Supreme Court judge. I think that's what she has said. There was a case that we reviewed uh, uh, that, that, that she, I think, was on the majority of saying that or in the minority, I think, in the dissenting opinion on some case. I, 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 I might have to double check on that one, but I think she said uh, specifically that there's no sort of common law basis for keeping felons from possessing firearms. In other words, the, fel the, the prohibition on firearms for felons is subordinate to their right to possess a firearm because when the Second Amendment was being contemplated back during the founding era, there was uh, no real discussion about being convicted of a felon would impede your ability to, to have a firearm under the Second Amendment. Interesting debate surrounding all of that. 